Okay, well, first of all, can I uh, welcome you all and introduce myself. I'm uh, Brian Loder, and I'm one of the editors of the journal Information Communication Society, together with uh, Bill Dutton. Uh, and can I first of all thank uh, the Oxford Internet Institute for uh, sponsoring this webcast for ICS. And we're delighted today to have uh, two uh, excellent scholars who have done a great deal of work over recent years looking at the voluntary sector, and that is the topic of today's uh, paper, a paper which I should say is uh, freely available online uh, to be downloaded for the next six months anyway, so get it while you can, as it were. Um, our two scholars are uh, John Taylor, who's at uh, Glasgow Caledonian University, where he's Professor of Government and Information Management, and he's also a Research Associate here at the OII, uh, and Eleanor Burt, who's at the School of Management at St Andrews University, uh, also in Scotland. And the title of their, their paper uh, and presentation today is How Well Do Voluntary Organisations Perform on the Web as Democratic Actors? Thank you, Ellen. Okay, thanks, Brian. Uh, and good evening to everybody. And on behalf of John and myself, uh, thanks for the invitation to be here tonight. Uh, always nice to have a trip to Oxford. Right, good. Right, just to put this into some context, um, why are we interested in voluntary organisations um, and their performance on the web as actors in the polity? Well, firstly, um, we should say that our primary interest is in these organisations as actors in the polity, as, as democratic actors as we've referred to them. Our interest in them as actors in the web environment in this capacity is because the reach, the immediacy, the potential for transparency that the web brings um, brings a, a new set of imperatives um, to the need to look at these organisations as democratic actors. It reinforces for us the importance of looking at them critically and, and reflecting upon the, the nature of their engagement in the, in the polity. It's also an aspect that, um, with the exception of political scientists um, and their interests in interest groups and cause groups and the kind of power and influence that goes on in there, that, that's been largely missing certainly within the mainstream voluntary sector um, literature. Um, uh, the academics there have tended to focus much more on the service provider role than on the democratic role. Um, so that was another reason for us wanting to, to have a look at them uh, from this perspective. There are organisations that um, occupy positions within our society, our economy and our polity that place them at least potentially, if not actually, in powerful and influential positions. And just to give some rough idea of that, if we take figures from the UK Voluntary Sector Almanac um, from 2006, which are the latest figures we have, um, there are around 169,000 what they call general charities. Now, general charities are just a part of this bigger third sector. Um, the sector has seen a net increase of charities since 2000 of 28,000, so it's expanding quite considerably over time. In 2003 4, the, um, the sector's total income was more than £26 billion. Uh, pounds. And the number of charities with, over, uh, with incomes of over £1 million pounds has more than doubled in just a decade. And we're also seeing a group of around 14 what we're now terming um, super charities emerging with incomes of over £100 million pounds per annum. So as I say, that gives a kind of crude sense of the, the scale um, and the potential um, of this sector. But more broadly than that, it is difficult to think of any aspect of our society or our economy um, or, or polity in which these organisations don't have some reach, to which they're, they're not embedded to some extent. For instance, um, as I'm sure you'll know, the, the work of Robert Putnam and others, the sector's been argued to have a role in building social capital. And that's about developing cohesion, it's about developing neighbourliness, community spirit. And if you think about organisations, for instance, like the Girl Guides and the Boy Scouts that we're all familiar with, um, it's also argued to have a role in developing values within society, developing kind of moral codes and so forth. 
It's also um, thought to have a role in building labour capital um, as well as social capital. And there, what's being talked about is bringing people into the labour market through the third sector who would otherwise find it difficult or impossible to be part of the mainstream labour market. Um, so they're bringing in people who perhaps have disabilities, um, learning impairments, or who have been long-term unemployed, for instance. People who are marginalised and vulnerable in that kind of employment capacity and have a role there in preparing them, giving them the skills and the confidence to enter the mainstream um, labour market. As democratic actors, they have a, a number of roles, or they're certainly perceived to have a number of roles. And one of those is to act as a bridge between government and um, uh, citizens. Another is to mediate the power of the state and the power of, of commercial enterprise, if you like. They're thought to have a role in giving a voice to the marginalised and the vulnerable in our communities, and also um, to inject quite a healthy pluralism into the democratic polity. Bolly and Thomas have talked about them being very influential in the global sphere, in part because they have a, a global infrastructure, some of these organisations. But they've also said that they have a language and a discourse that can make them very influential in shaping culture and, and shaping, again, kind of values and attitudes and so forth. In the UK, what we've been seeing um, since the election of the, the first Blair government and with the, the, the Brown government is wanting to engage more closely with this sector. And academics such as Kendall and others have talked about uh, government wanting to mainstream the sector, primarily into service delivery, um, delivering public services. Um, they've developed a compact with the sector, for instance, to help that to happen when they've set out protocols and guiding principles for the relationship between the state, between public sector bodies and the voluntary sector. But they've also wanted to go beyond engaging them in the service providing role to engage them more closely as democratic actors um, within the public policy process to give them more of a voice there. And part of the reasoning behind that has been in part because the sector appears to be relatively well trusted um, compared to some parts of, of government and the public sector. But they're thought very importantly to bring uh, an expertise and a knowledge to the public policy process um, that goes beyond what public bodies um, themselves are able to bring, in part because of their frontline service activity, uh, in part because of research that they do or that they commission and so forth. And because they are thought to have a better feel for the communities that they work with, they're, they're thought to be much closer to those communities than public bodies um, tend to be. But in all of this, what we're seeing is an absence of debate about the, um, well, firstly, whether these organisations should have the right to engage within the polity. And if they do have this right to engage, if we're agreed that they have this right to engage, then about what form this should take and under what conditions it should happen. About key aspects of the engagement, such as the representativeness of the, the communities um, that they purport to represent. How effectively do they represent those communities? And also within that debate, um, there needs to be um, discussion about their legitimacy and their accountability as they play out that role. Now, why has there been this absence of debate here? Well, possibly for a number of reasons, one of which might be that there's perhaps a taken for grantedness about this sector um, on the part of the public, um, on the part of, of, of government, for instance. Um, there's something a taken for grantedness about the goodness of the sector. It's philanthropic, it's charitable, therefore it's good, it's benevolent. It feels very uncomfortable to ask questions that have a critical edge when you talk about charities or voluntary organisations or non-governmental organisations um, or uh, social enterprises, for example. But there is um, an academic who has offered a, a very 
Re are questioning an invitation to critical reflection where he draws attention to voluntary failure. And he talks about philanthropic insufficiency, philanthropic paternalism, philanthropic particularism, and philanthropic amateurism. This is a, a, a North American academic, uh, Salomon. He wasn't discussing the role in the polity when he coined this theory or these, these concepts. But they do, I think, in this context, invite us to ask questions, important questions, about the capacity and the capability of these organisations to engage effectively, about their representativeness, about the narrowly held positions articulated by some voluntary organisations, about the exclusion of some views, some groups whose views that they disagree with, and about the quality of the argument and the evidence that they provide. So in terms of the, the research questions, to move on from that, that broad context, what were we asking about? Well, we wanted to look at how voluntary organisations were using their websites to engage citizens as democratic actors and to look at how they were doing that, if they were doing it. We wanted to know how they were attempting to use their websites to convey their legitimacy as democratic actors, to represent citizens and to debate issues, and how they were doing that. And we wanted to know what, if anything, they were doing to convey their accountability in the democratic sphere and how they were using the web to support this. So how do we go about um, answering these questions? Well, we completed uh, literature reviews that embraced the academic literature, public policy literature and other commentaries as well. And we then moved forward with an exploratory study that was aimed firstly and primarily at generating debate, generating discussion um, about the contributions and roles and responsibilities of voluntary organisations. And secondly, we wanted to begin to develop an analytical framework or an evaluative framework um, that would enable us to, to look um, at, the, at this, this role and how they deliver on it. And then, of course, we wanted to use that in the web environment uh, and see how they were using the web in this role. We looked at five um, websites, five organisations' websites in some considerable um, depth. All of these are campaigning organisations based in the UK, but they have either a national or an international profile. And we examined these websites against a set of criteria so that we could look at them systematically and we could make comparisons across them. Now, at the same time, we were aware that um, as an exploratory study, we were possibly going to find things on those websites, data emerging from them, that were going to feed back into that um, evaluative framework and help us to, to further develop it and further refine it. So what informed the framework that we were working with? Well, firstly, we were looking at these uh, democratic values of democratic engagement, organisational legitimacy and public accountability. And then at the next level down, we were looking at what we've called democratic characteristics. In terms of um, democratic engagement or citizen engagement, we found Barber's concept of strong democratic talk was very useful. And that drew our attention to five key characteristics of democratic engagement all of which the web environment can support, and all of which we would argue you can reasonably expect voluntary organisations um, to be using uh, and engaging with. Barber draws out that strong democratic talk is about listening, it's about emotional engagement, about feeling, um, about passion. It's about informed thinking, and it's about talking or debating based on that informed thinking and acting based also on that informed thinking. Now in terms of legitimacy, the literature is a bit more fragmented but you can still draw out a number of, of, of characteristics that come through with some consistency in the literature. For example, um, adherence to legislative and regulatory requirements bestows a certain level of legitimacy upon an organisation. 
the extent to which the organisation can show that it's representative of the community that it purports to represent also bestows some legitimacy. It can also be argued that their philosophy, their values, their mission and so forth, again, um, their moral code as well, bestow a certain legitimacy on the organisations. And we've said earlier that they are also seem to have authority um, grounded in their expertise, grounded in the fact that they work in the field um, and in their research evidence. And finally, uh, legitimacy can come from uh, independence and that's something that's quite important um, in awarding charitable status, for instance, that they're seen to have a formal independence um, from government, uh, uh, for example. So that's another key aspect of legitimacy. We found in terms of public accountability, um, Leet's conceptualisation was helpful there. And she draws attention to the need to um, give account, to take account of, and to be accountable to. So those are the, the, the characteristics, the democratic characteristics there um, that sit against that democratic value of public accountability. And again, it seems reasonable to expect voluntary organisations as democratic actors to embrace these forms of accountability. But I, I think that context of engagement with, the, the, with government is, is really the key mm. point, I think, for me in all of this that, that explains it. That government, of course, we, we believe that governments are accountable, they're publicly accountable, yes, they need yes, to be yes. to citizens who vote for them, etc. Et mm. mm. And as you suck in these, these um, third sector bodies to deliver services at big, big time, uh, with all kinds of heady agendas, not least uh, an electronic agenda, the electronic uh, mixed economy mm. That, was, mm. that was being pushed forward two or three years ago, that the government would actually take itself out of service providing and give it all to the, the voluntary sector. Very peculiar ideas. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the, the backdrop mm. that begins to say, that begins to alert you to, to you know, what are these organisations mm. uh, and, and to what extent can we as citizens, if they are in these roles, trust what they're doing. Mm -hmm. I think, I think mm -hmm. that's the point. Because surely what one expects is that the, the distrust we have of governments these days will pass over to these organisations and they'll become contaminated. So that they, be, they must surely be thinking about this, they'll be very leery of getting anywhere near the government. Well, exactly, I, I, and we've written about that too. Which yeah. is <laughs> <good>. <laughs> <laughs> I this is the, 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 the first part of the evaluative instrument that's focusing on citizen engagement. We set out there, again, the, these democratic characteristics of inviting engagement, of listening, of informed reflection and discussion and action. So this was a starting point for the analytical framework. But we had to take this further, we felt, um, in order to actually um, do this evaluation. Now, the web environment um, affords what have become, in some respects, fairly standard capabilities that we can map against these democratic values and the democratic characteristics in the form of web content, if you like. So, for example, amongst the kind of things that we expected to find, um, or we anticipated we would find, were things like personal blogs emotive imagery, information about local groups, by way of drawing people in, by way of, of making them feel that this was an organisation um, dealing with issues that they would find um, exciting, that they found, you know, they had a, a passion um, to be involved in and so forth. We were looking for examples um, in terms of listening of stakeholders, uh, citizens, supporters um, being invited to comment perhaps on the organisation's campaigning strategy. So that kind of thing. Um, and it's set out uh, much more fully in the, the, the paper itself. These are just really examples of the types of things that we were, we were looking for. Um, we were anticipating that informed reflection would um, involve information being, um, being made available, obviously, um, through reports, through briefings and so forth, um, through links to independent bodies as well, independent voluntary organisations, uh, government bodies, research institutions and so forth. And in terms of legitimacy, and that set of, of, of democratic characteristics, again, examples of what we anticipated we might find. Um, information about the organisation's governance process, for example. Perhaps information about the membership profile. 
We were looking uh, in terms of, of organisational status for information um, about stakeholders and dependencies and affiliations, vested interests if you like, because a lot of these organisations are involved in complex um, accountability relationships, complex funding relationships and so forth. Can we ask them? No. Sorry? Can, you, can, can I speed up? speed up? Okay, cheers. <coughs> Okay, in terms of accountability, again, the kinds of things that we were looking for here um, were perhaps the mission statement, policy statement perhaps, um, performance reports. Um, in terms of being accountable, I'll just jump down to that one. Uh, complaints process perhaps set out information about charitable status, where organisations had a charitable status. What did we find? Well, we expected that citizen engagement would be the best developed um, of these um, because it's really what these organisations are about. It's the frontline activity. But we found variability across all of the organisations, but on the whole, a low-level exploitation of the web. And the overwhelming use of the websites was really to provide information, um, mainly through their own research. Um, but, um, but we also found that at the time that we did the research that they were all providing links out from their own organisation to other independent sources. This is uh, among what large, how many organisations? We uh, looked at five, five, five uh, key organisations, yeah. 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 Um, just moving on again, um, reasonably quickly I hope. Um, in terms of, of legitimacy, Again, we found a lot of variability and we found that this was quite sparse, what we were finding here, that um, none of the organisations provided information about legislative or regulatory requirements or how they met these. And this included the two bodies that had charitable status. They obviously signalled that they were charities, they have to do that, but they didn't provide other information about what charitable status meant. Um, the charities did make their annual reports and accounts available on the web. One of the voluntary organisations published its, its uh, governing instrument and one did provide information about its membership profile, um, but it was extremely uh, limited. So those were the types of, of things that we were finding there. In terms of accountability, well, the situation was broadly uh, similar here um, with respect to accountability. There was probably um, more activity on the part of the organisations in relation to giving account than in terms of taking account of or being accountable to. And that perhaps is suggestive of Salomon's concept of philanthropic paternalism, that these organisations know what is best and therefore don't feel the need to actually take account of citizens or supporters. Um, or to be accountable um, to them. So in summary, very considerable variation across the organisations in relation with these uh, three values that are, are fundamental um, in a democratic process. We didn't find any exemplars within this, uh, this group of organisations, despite the fact that they are household names. They're all household names, they're all leaders in their field, and they're all, as I've said, of national and international standing and outlook. At most, we found modest indications um, of engagement in democratic talk, but not strong democratic talk. We found modest indications um, of a legitimation narrative developing and of regard for public accountability, but they were modest. Um, and, and one is tempted to think perhaps more by accident than, than design here. Finally, um, the questions that um, we felt were raised by the research findings. Is under-exploitation of the web in the ways that we found um, about resource constraints? Is it about Salomon's concept of philanthropic insufficiency uh, in general? Is it perhaps about what he terms philanthropic amateurism? Perhaps naivety might be a better word there in terms of their understanding of what the web can do for them here. 
in failing to appreciate its potential to allow this pursuit of democratic values and responsibilities. Are the reasons more fundamental than this? Um, is it about this level, this, this perception, this, this taken for grantedness on the part of governments and the media, as well as citizens, that these are essentially good organisations um, and that we shouldn't really question or, or be too critical um, of this role and their performance in this role? Is it perhaps about voluntary organisations' um, perception that they have a right to voice and to influence within the democratic sphere? Um, so we're coming back to Salomon's concept of philanthropic paternalism here, perhaps. Um, this this um, perception, as I say, that they have the right, that they know what is best for citizens, that they know how to, to take an issue um, forward. Is it perhaps about um, needing leadership in those kinds of directions within the sector? in respect of its responsibilities in the democratic sphere. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> okay, then, would you like to come and join us then? And I would we indeed. Can, uh, we've got a, a good uh, 20 minutes to 30 minutes uh, discussion. Oh, yes. Well, look, look, let's, let's just explain. I mean, they were selected uh, in, when we did our first study, which seems like well, it is years ago now, isn't it? I think it was 2000. Yes. And we did that, um, and we, what we did was selected them on the basis of high profile in that particular year. They were all vigorously campaigning. They all commanded lots of column entries in the Economist newspaper. I think that was our main mm, way of sure. selecting them, actually. And uh, so they, they had that profile. Significant organisations. We went back to the same ones, was it two, 2006? Yes. Uh, and largely found the same things happening, this lack of yeah. accountability, legitimacy and democratic engagement that we think might just be a bit more significant than, than Yorick, but I'm not, I'm not sure whether we've convinced him yet, but um, maybe he'll well, tell just, us in a minute. Just before we go on to that, mm. could it, just another point of um, mm. um, clarification. I think, I suspect that we're going to have a debate about terminology, because it's quite interesting that you've said what they are, because a lot of people think of those as movements, and they wouldn't mm. necessarily think of them as voluntary organisations mm. and charities, mm. and you mentioned mm. charity a lot mm. as well, mm. and of course then you've got in the States philanthropy, <laughs> then we combine it and call it the third sector, mm. I think this, uh, mm. probably we might need to tease some of these mm. things out, but just for, do you know, uh, am I right in thinking that in terms of charitable status, in order to gain charitable status in the UK, you're not allowed to be political, are you? You're not allowed to be political, that's right. That, that, so that, 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 well. But political is defined in a very particular way. You're yep. not allowed to have a, an affiliation that is, you know, overtly yep. support for. But a here you're party, thinking about it in a broader political, governance. yeah, in a, in a much broader yep. government yes, sense. The, the yeah. Charities Act does not allow an organisation, an organisation, not a movement, an organisation, yep. uh, to be party political. Yeah, yep. it's legal. Yep. That's the yep. point. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. That's great. Thanks. What about this issue of accountability then? Did, do you want to put it back on the table? And, uh, uh, I, mean, I, think I don't know quite... whatever about this. I'm just here as an amateur sort of in the OAI. So I'm in the OAI, but I'm in, I'm nothing about this at all. I, just, I mean, I have the standard sort of um, instincts about the nature of fascism and so on. I mean, that you know, that one definition of fascism is to eliminate all possible political entities between the state and the individual, and you know, and, and that's why Boy Scouts are always repressed under totalitarian regimes, because there's this idea that things like the Boy Scouts say must have a legitimacy. And it's denied to them. And see, I don't think that Boy Scouts need legitimacy. I think any group of people should better run Boy Scouts if they want, as long as they aren't breaking the law, which of course is then circular. What breaking the law means? Mm. But this whole idea—I I, I know because it's a very lively issue of the change in charitable status, isn't it? I mean, mm. the government is trying to mm. impose conditions on charities for their quote-unquote tax-free status. Mm. So I mean, this is hot. Mm. There, isn't it? Mm. I, I don't have strong views, and I know I have no information or anything that entitles me to views. I just have strong instincts. No, no, but I think the, the point you make is, is, is a good point uh, and does need clarification. And what, but one of the issues in terms of accountability is public money. Mm. And, and is, that, is that convincing to you that if, if these organisations, I mean, you can make the claim mm. that they shouldn't have public money, I suppose, but if they are, and in fact, indeed, as you're saying, they're being pushed down the line where they're expected to take more, yes. presumably accountability is an mm. aspect of that. So well, there's two parts. So one is taking public money directly, like, in a sense, and Oxbridge College takes public money, and that's a charity. Mm -hmm. um, there's also, of course, the issue of tax concessions, which is not in a sense taking public money, but the government likes to pretend it is taking public money, so there's a yeah. special twist there, isn't there? Mm -hmm. If we give you a tax concession, you're taking our money. So, I mean, that is often used as a lever, isn't it? But mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a separate case, I think. Yeah. 
but yeah. Mm. Oh. I mean, I, I would sort of want, um, there might be a less fundamental reason that is, for example, they're just not innovative, okay, that they're technologically uh, stuck because these are established organizations that um, a number of others besides those that you've mentioned, I've noticed they're, you know, they're very well established, they, they were born in a different era, and they have been slow to adopt new technology. So I would like to, I mean, I would think you need to talk to the to leadership within the organizations and say if they've even thought about democratic accountability or just they just thinking of the web as, oh, this is something we've got to do because we're expected to do this. They probably thought getting on the web itself yeah. was a big concession to, you know, democratic. But, but do they think about democratic accountability would be important to yeah. me. Yeah. No, I, I think that, that I think there's there's two things. In in terms of innovation, the sector generally um, has a a reputation, if you like. Again, it's 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 thought to be an innovative sector. And and if you look at work, for instance, from you know by Stephen Osborne, um, you know there, there's certainly evidence to suggest that these organisations are innovative. I think a lot does depend on how you define innovation, and I'm sure there are some aspects of the organisation where they're more innovative than others. Yeah. And, and so, yes, that you know that might be um, one reason um, this reputation for innovativeness why you might expect them to actually be trying to do things with their websites. Um, but yeah, I think um, it, it, it's interesting when you, when you look at these organisations that the websites are well developed in some respects. They're obviously well supported in thinking about them in some respects, like marketing, like fundraising, like attracting in um, volunteers and so forth. Um, so I think there is something m more fundamental going on there about how they perceive their democratic role and how they're thinking about that. You're, you're identifying this democratic role in an ideal type way, aren't you? And I'm just wondering, is, is, that, is that fair, actually, in a sense? If you were to look at other elements of the political domain, mm -hmm. where would you find this democratic ideal online? You know, political parties or mm -hmm. activist groups of various kinds? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's been a lot of discussion and debate about mm -hmm. online democratic mm -hmm. governments for a long mm -hmm. time, but actually a lot of the results are really rather disappointing mm -hmm. wherever you look. Mm. Not just. I was saying, is that is that? Yeah, I think I think I don't. I don't well, you can answer after you've thought a bit. But uh, I don't think we're looking for an ideal type of, uh, of organisational response to any of this stuff. We're we're looking for a nod in the in the direction of yeah. it. Mm -hmm. And and the curious thing, I think, each time you've looked at these sites, is that there isn't that nod in the direction. Mm -hmm. On your point about innovation. Ellen and I did a, a, a project under the Virtual Society mm -hmm. Program, wasn't it, mm -hmm. in which we found extraordinary levels of innovation mm -hmm. in this sector mm -hmm. using ICTs more generally. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the Samaritans uh, reconfiguring their networks mm -hmm. uh, in the most brilliant way, I thought at the time, uh, to, in order to, en uh, to better to engage their uh, labour force, to manage a shrinking labour force, as it were, uh, to, to do all those things that businesses would do. But they were a, a charity doing this, you know, and they were, they were genuine innovation. Amnesty, with its um, e-carding system, what were they doing? I can't remember the story now, but they were, they were certainly innovating around uh, trying to get mobilised support uh, into uh, release of prisoners in, in overseas uh, uh, situations. And um, lots of good stuff, and it was mission-related innovation. I think that's the point. It was mi and I think they're, not, they're very open-minded and, and they're very energetic about getting the mission delivered. What they're not energetic about or thought, thinking about, par paradigmatically, I think they're locked into mission. They're not locked into questions of accountability or legitimacy or those boring things. Um, and they've been accepted for so long that they don't, that nobody demands it of them almost. And yet what we... You might say the same of business. I mean, the, the front, <coughs> a company is made accountable by law and forced to have accountants, but the aim of the company is not to be accountable. The aim of the company is to make money or to provide a product. So, I mean, in a sense, they're no different, are they? It's they're mission-driven, as you say. And yeah, but increasingly they're being sucked in, and they are being they are influential in in, in shaping discourse and shaping debate in delivering services, and so on. Now, there are huge perils in, in particularly in service providing. I think for, for these organisations, but nonetheless, they are in those positions increasingly, and so it, I think it does beg some questions about you know the extent to which they should be revealing something more about themselves. 
uh, than they do. Um, I thought it was interesting, the Public Accounts Committee of the House of Commons in July, I think, uh, uh, argued in a, in a report, that they, they just can't say anything about the voluntary sector, they don't, because nothing is known about it. They can't, there's, there's a lot of uh, assumption about the, the sector being amazingly good at what it does, but that committee came to the conclusion, you, and there's no evidence for that. It's, it's a set of assumptions in our political culture that these are very good organisations run by very good people, all of them, you know, committed to mission, uh, and we don't need to know any more about that. The public accounts were was saying, well, this won't wash, we can't say these organisations are better than public service organisations <coughs> or private sector firms because we don't have the evidence to demonstrate it. And that's part of this whole argument that I think is yeah. circulating yeah. around this talk. Yeah, that's right, but I, I think certainly on the the service providing side of things, the sector is itself getting concerned about you know about some of these these aspects and that it, it needs to better engage with them. Yeah. Um, I think that, that's fair to say, and we're we're not looking for a kind of ideal. And and also I think not coming at this from a perspective of you know working the sector. That's not what it's about. It's about thinking about the, <coughs> the context that it works in now and the way that that's changing and the way public expectations are changing and so forth. And therefore, if these organisations you know, want to continue to have this level of trust and so forth in the longer term, then maybe these are issues that they need to start and address and, and begin to engage with. And it's really just to put that out there and, and, and ask those questions and, and, as I said at the beginning, try and generate discussion. It's, it's not about, you know, thumping them and, and, and offering up some, you must be doing this, you know, you, you ought to be doing this. But this gets back to the very first question about accountable to whom. Mm. And because um, my experience in some voluntary organizations is that they're very concerned about the boundaries of their organization. Mm -hmm. And that the web is not good in that respect. Mm -hmm. That is, they want to be responsive to their membership, the, mm -hmm. the people who are active in their organization, and not necessarily, they're very frightened often of websites because other they would not necessarily want or think it would be legitimate for people who are don't, not giving their time or not volunteering or not part of the organization to start influencing their agenda, I would think. They would be one, and the, you know, the web has no boundaries and it's sort of, so having a lot of feedback and voting and polling and uh, that would be undermine. I mean, they would view that as really undermining the, their own membership, undermining accountability to their membership, maybe. I'm sure you'll find much more, I mean, I'm not saying we should, but, you know, one could look for examples of this further back and say the Brown government's desire, or it went back to Blair, didn't it, to involve charities in the social yeah. uh, provision. I mean, I mean, think of things like volunteer fire brigades. I mean, that's, that's a simply an interesting case, because mm -hmm. they're, in a sense, volunteer fire brigades do, in fact, take over the role that would normally be provided through tax money. Mm -hmm. And I mean, since you have, you know, you, <laughs> you wouldn't want an incompetent volunteer fire brigade. I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, these have been faced, St. John's Ambulance, I mean, these things have been faced before, haven't they? I mean, and they have to be run almost military style. That's yeah. right, yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, or the, of course, the, light, the RLI, the light I mean, that's yeah. a big one, isn't it? I mean, yeah. the, the country relies on the, R, the lifeboat yeah. institution, yes. and they're, they're pretty high tech. Mm -hmm. yes. But I don't know how much public money the government, sure you do, I mean, you didn't choose them, but I mean, there'd be an interesting case, I think, because they are, they are the only provision. They not get any public money, they rely entirely on donations. But they're the only provision in that sector, aren't they? I mean, if they don't come and get you, nobody does. Mm. Maybe a helicopter if you're very lucky. Mm. But just to go back to the, the, the mm. definitions again, a lot of the ones you mentioned mm. seem to be campaign organisations. Mm. They, well, they weren't service providers, That's they? what we chose That's at right. the time. We, we chose deliberately chose yeah. them. Okay, but you are making that, that distinction. Well. Obviously, some are. Mm -hmm. Oh, some are both, some are more service providers and some are campaign. Yes. Yeah. And you might expect them to think about the internet in quite different ways, wouldn't you? The service providers and the campaigners? Well, the issue of accountability, for example, mm. if you're a campaign yeah. organisation, you might well argue that um, you don't, you know, the independent side, being yeah. outside of the system, mm. is much more crucial mm -hmm. to you mm -hmm. and your, your mm -hmm. legitimacy. Mm -hmm. legitimacy mm -hmm. and, the, and the kind of mm -hmm. framing mm -hmm. that you're engaged with and well, that you're engaged with. Um, that's certainly one of the reasons why some voluntary <coughs> organisations don't want charitable status because they want an element of, of freedom, um, and you know you, you can you can empathise with that, you can understand why they want that, and there are good reasons for that. Um, 
but nonetheless, it, it, it does seem that um, you know the only requirements on them there are that they act within the law. They don't go out and do something that's criminal, for yeah. instance, when they're protesting and so forth. So there's that kind of very broad accountability on them. Um, but nonetheless, I think, and people will have very different views on this, given the fact that they have a voice, that it's a powerful voice, that they are in receipt of money, that they are engaging with government, then it does seem that you can at least ask the question, should there not be some mm. other forms of, of accountability requirement on them beyond mm. that, that? What about freedom of information legislation? It's probably, I mean, well, recently there's... They're not captured there's by it, of course. No, they're, they're, they're not, not captured they're by not part of that. Uh, the commissioners not, want them in. Right. Right. That's yeah. another yeah. development that's yeah. going yeah. on. The commissioners yeah. want them in. Because yeah. yeah. there's a recent change in that. I'm not mm. too up to, to date, but there's recent, I know there's recent stuff. Well, there's debate going on. Yeah. Well, there's a requirement on parish councils, which I realise are not, no. I mean, they are voluntary, yeah. but they're also yeah. statutory as well, yeah, the yeah. um, but uh, yeah. they, are, they are quite strict requirements that, uh, by the commissioner mm. there mm. about information mm. that they mm. must make available on websites, actually websites. Yeah. Well. I was wondering if Alan had a sense of what the minimum requirements might be for, for a, a campaigning organisation that you'd want to see coming up into the public eye, as it were. Uh, you know, do, is, it, is it to know? What, what their, where their sources of funding come from, for example, to get us, should they be revealing yeah. that? Should they be saying something about their, their membership numbers and the geographic mm. spread of their membership? Mm. Or, you know, mm. I mean, mm. you, you talked about the ideal type, I would bring it right down to, a, mm. you know, just the minimum mm. uh, set of requirements mm. that you might expect a pub, very, very high profile, significant influences mm. in, in all kinds of ways uh, to, to have, um, to, to be revealing. So they historically haven't done because we haven't asked them to. We don't question these do-gooders in our society. Mm. They're doing good. That's all we need yeah. to know. Mm. I, I, I think the minimum requirements that you, that you might ask um, are, yes, about funding. Where does, what is the funding base? What, is it, what does it look like? Um, what does the membership profile look like? Um, and you know, what is the evidence base? Because again, we hear a lot about the evidence that these organisations bring to the table. And that's one of the things that is attractive. But it's also one of the things that we don't know a lot about, um, unless you have access, for instance, to their research reports, and you can actually read those, and you can see what questions they've asked to the commission to do the research, how independent is it, that kind of thing. Um, but that's not always there, and it's not always there in any substantive way. You might just find a briefing paper, perhaps, rather than the, the actual research. And, and I think also a sense of um, you know, a statement of what their values are, because the way you come at a piece of evidence um, can be influenced, or, or the extent to which you dismiss a piece of evidence can be very influenced by the position that you take, what your value position is. And so those would seem like four, you know, fundamentals, I think, in, in that respect. Mm. What about privacy issues of the citizen, though? Is, is there also an issue uh, for a lot of people either giving uh, resources, their time or money, support to these voluntary organisations? Maybe one of those underlying difficulties uh, might also be that if, if too many demands are made upon them, uh, including you know, their privacy, they may actually decide they don't want to give. I mean, is there, is there a difficulty there? Could you actually envision a situation where they might make too much information available? On the website. I'm not sure I understand the privacy. Well, I just wonder of whether, and I'm, I'm well, speculating here on the motivation yeah, of sure. people who give yeah. their time. I mean, at one, yeah. on one level, you say, well, who are these yeah. people to do yeah. this and who are, they, who are they representing? Yeah. But they clearly feel they are. They clearly yeah. feel they've got an, yeah. an axe to grind, yeah. an yeah. issue, a mission. Yeah. Uh, and they don't want to be questioned about it necessarily. And mm. if, you, if, you start, if they have to start going through bureaucratic hurdles, mm. They may feel they don't want to engage anymore. Yeah. They might withdraw. Yeah. You yeah. think, oh, to help, you know. That's exactly my. It, that it, <coughs> and in fact, your your criteria could have a negative impact <coughs> on organizations. <coughs> that is, <coughs> if they if you created a, a a wide variety of bureaucratic hurdles. <coughs> that is, <coughs> okay, we've got to have our interactive website and we have to have our value statement. <coughs> I mean, you could just 
undermine the vitality of these organizations. Create, you know, it'd be like university assessment exercises, not to mention that. Yeah, we wouldn't want any of that. Let's not bring things down. <laughs> Where would you be to go, yeah. Bill? <laughs> well, it's a clear example of that, can't you? Yes. Um, and one clear example that hits the press, of course, is, um, is the certification of anyone who works with children. Yes. I mean, yes. you know, yes. this is clearly yes. hitting the scouts, the guides, mm. and all these things. Mm. And it's mm. not because they're all pedophiles. Mm. It's mm. because it's just re de depressing people mm. to have to go through this process, mm. isn't it? Mm. And then it's well, that's right. And it takes a long time. Yeah. And, it's, yeah. it's, and it's, it's costly. Too. And costly. Yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, yeah. That, that's you right. can't transfer it from one organisation to another, can you? You have to start all over again. Yeah. 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 No, that's right. But, but I think, at, you know, at a very basic level, I mean, you know, when we use the web, we're often asked these days to register you know, in order to mm. buy something off the web. And, and, and sometimes when you do that, you think, why on earth do I have to do this? Um, do I really want this product so much that I'm going to register? That's right. But I wonder how often people actually do go through that and think, well, you know, OK, I'm putting some details out here. You might wonder a bit about your, your privacy there and so forth. You might think, oh, this is a bit of a waste of time. But Certainly I, on the whole, would do it. Nine times out of ten, I put those details in because I want to purchase that product. And I think if I feel very strongly about an issue, uh, and again, you have to assume that some people at least feel very strongly about this, this issue, and they're probably the ones that are going to be the most active in that organisation in trying to influence its position and influence what goes forward, then it seems to me that the decision would be, yes, I'll, I'll put some details up there. And they don't, of course, need to be traced back to, you know, to that individual. The kind of, 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 of data that we're suggesting, the, the kind of information, would be very broad brush in terms of giving a sense of what that membership yeah. profile looks like. Um, well, the hot one there recently, of course, is the BNP membership list, isn't it? I mean, um, that's yeah. obviously cost lots of people their jobs. Got and, um, really the the yeah. BNP must have wondered why it didn't allow people to join anonymously because it would have been attractive. Mm. I'm not suggesting ways in which they could improve their membership. <laughs> that was my point. But I mean, it, it is an interesting case, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Well, the ALF, the ALF seems to be an interesting case too, the Animal Liberation Front. Mm. It is usually they, they're a group who, are obviously on the edge of legitimacy, mm. Mm. have been very innovative in their use of the web, haven't they? I mean, they, I gather they're able to have these sort of flash mobs partly because they're organized mm -hmm. through the web. Mm -hmm. um, That's right. So they are actually are innovative web users, although yeah. not a... Not revealing much. Mm -hmm. Not revealing much. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but maybe this is something in a way, I mean, you, you, you're touching on, I think, what, it's quite an interesting point there. You know, we're talking about organisations that have got the potential to be part of, of, of the public policy process, to have a voice in that. Now, some of these types of organisations are not going to be no, no, having no. that kind of voice. Of no, so yeah, the I think there is, there is a difference to be made, you know, a, a quite an important difference there, that if you are allowed around that policy table, if you're allowed in to give evidence to a committee, I think then this kind of demonstration of, of your legitimacy, where your evidence base comes from, what your expertise is, then becomes you know, uh, quite salient. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that there is a, perhaps a case there. Um, There's quite a, a literature on transparency and trust, isn't there, which uh, uh, people here have contributed to. And, um, uh, and I was reading something recently, a nice bit of research, which was dem which for the first time was, as it were, demonstrating that, uh, that transparency can uh, and does, in fact, enhance public trust um, in organisations in particular kinds of ways. Um, so that you know, the, the, if you if you are revealing things about yourself, this was actually written for the public service organisations, actually rather than voluntary sector. But uh, nonetheless, I think it might apply. But if you are revealing aspects of the way you, you you operate to a greater degree, if your website has got more information on it of that kind, then you will en you will enhance public trust in the organisation. They will believe they, they they believe you're more honest. I think that was one of the, I think this, this research looked at honesty, benevolence, and performance, and they concluded that performance was not, was that the sense of improved performance was not enhanced by greater transparency, but the sense of honesty and benevolence, in other words, moral values coming through, was enhanced by public, uh, by, by uh, transparent, greater transparency. So again, I mean, there's a balance to be struck here, isn't there? But I think if you're if you're looking to appreciate these organisations more in their 
policy process roles, then somewhat more than we've seen, you know, somewhat more of a focus on those kinds of revelations would seem to be a good idea for them, for, for them, for them themselves to gain more public trust in an era when they're being brought more into the public domain. Okay, but then that could just create a, a strategy for people, you know, to sort of fake, fake a, you know, the fraudulent websites to create a sense of uh, moral hazard. Yeah, this is yeah. moral hazard, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But then you could ask, you could say the same about organisations that you know um, that are charities, and and and, and you know. What, what are they giving to the Charity yeah. Commission? I mean, you know, yeah. are, are they being honest about what they're giving to what extent yeah. can the Charity Commission look at? Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. I was intrigued by your, one of your points about um, the, the moral position of an organisation. It seems to me that, I mean, if, if, we, if we restrict the discussion more or less to those that are becoming involved with public services, which is, you know, the focus. Mm -hmm. But I mean, and so far as when Blair enunciated this, I mean, he clearly had the churches in mind mm -hmm. as part of it. Well, you couldn't require of churches in general that they had an acceptable moral position, could you? Because in a sense, some clearly don't. I mean, uh, I mean, if you're going to have a whole range of Muslim welfare organisations, you know, the Catholic Church, the whole the whole circuit, they don't have consistent moral positions. So, I mean, if you require them to have a moral position that is acceptable to some other body. You're finished, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. but I, that, that's not what we're saying. What we're no, no, saying is that yeah. if they have a strong moral position, yeah. you would expect to see that set out. Because some of these organisations will not be working on the basis of, of evidence. They'll be working on the basis of a philosophy or a, an argument. Right. That, and it's to see that argument set out. But they may not them. want to because it will attract public hostility. So I, mean, I can see their point in some cases. I mean, the more explicit you get, the more difficult things become, don't they? Yeah, but mm. surely... name a few examples. But surely that, that, that's part of, of engaging in a, in a democratic society. Is, is well, are they required? They, why, again, we go back to accountability. Mm. Why should they reveal all their moral positions? I don't see they should have to. I can't see what right anybody has to demand it of them. An issue... I, I mean, there's a disconnect there somewhere that I can quite see. Um, Just remind us again the the particular instances was one Friends of the Earth, do you say? Um, Greenpeace. Uh, Greenpeace. Far so Greenpeace way. on their website do not, you think, have a, a, a fairly good, how should we describe it, maybe not mission statement, that's the right way, but but that their values and concerns are not articulated on the website? Well, if, 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 you, if you compare with, um, this wasn't a... a a study that was written up, but but at, um, about 12 months ago, I looked at some of the, the service providing organisations, um, and on those organisations' websites, you know, one click of a button away was mission statement, vision statement, values statement, set out there fairly consistently across. I can't remember how many I looked at, but it was something like 50 or 60 of, of, yeah. the, of the top service providers. And it was set out very clearly there. And if you compare that with the, what we saw on these organizations' websites, but is it's that very because different. is that because those organizations are different? I well, mean, to be honest, I wouldn't expect to see a mission statement on something like you know an environmental campaign movement. I mean, because it would smack of commercialism, it would smack of a kind of managerial style almost that would mm. that would be off-putting, I think, for a lot of people who would look at that site. Mm. Nothing to back that up with, but you know, and I'm certainly not a skilled website designer. But or, uh, or to have a public yeah, vote on whether to uh, protest the particular yeah uh, movement or whatever. I mean, they can't. But you would expect them to have a deep sense of what they stand for and why you should be interested in this mm. and how you can do more and the, mm. and those kinds of. Things. You'd expect those to be articulated. Would you want to know, know where the sources of funding come from? Well, that's quite interesting because there was that case of the the Stansted Airport. Uh, it turned out to be funded by a, a company, uh, I can't remember the company, it was a, a high street uh, company that this guy had... In support had, of the... In support of, yeah. Mm -hmm. Splash or something. Well, would you want, I mean, the genetic point, I mean, would you want to know that? I mean, with a high profile campaign, would you want to know whether they're getting money coming in from other countries or other movements overseas or, or you know, are they indigenous, are they representing a particular 
cohort of the population in the UK. I mean, you know, would you want to know that? I, I actually don't know the answers either. I'm, I'm mm. very much fascinated, fascinated by the debate that Yorick started. I, mm. I mean, I don't know where we begin and end with this stuff, and we certainly don't want draconian rules of the game that insist on everything being right. But what we saw with these was actually very little nod, a surprisingly little nod in any kind of direction of the sorts we've been talking about. I think that's all I would, that's as far as I would go yeah. with it. But I, and I do think there's something to be said for knowing a bit more about them, like where they're, where they're funded. Okay. Yeah. Well, what, do you, what do you think of that point? Well, I think uh, the, uh, one, the potential for social accountability might be on the web, but not by these organizations. So if a citizens for such and such group is actually owned by a business that might have benefit by a, by a particular, you know, if they're fraud, misrepresenting themselves, well, I would think bloggers, I think, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is, this is, uh, dare I say it, a sort of a fifth estate <laughs> uh, operation where you could actually use the web to hold sort of um, organizations accountable. If, if people thought Greenpeace was doing the right or wrong thing, they would, they would be using the web but but so they don't need to have it internally within their own organization. But that's why again I think it's it's different in terms of the campaign groups and, and the service provider type groups, which I because again I, I think the issue of accountability there is also interesting in the sense that uh, are they more accountable in some senses to their sponsors, you know, uh, and you can certainly see that uh, many local governments, for example. Um, use voluntary central organisations as representatives because it's hugely costly to go and do surveys to find out stuff and consult with their local population. Um, they often find it very difficult to get a good response, as you know. Mm -hmm. But if they can go to each concern and say, "Look, you know, here's some money. Can you can you go and do a consultation for us, please, on service provision for mm -hmm. older people in this area?" And then we can tick a box and we can demonstrate to our people upstairs that you know we've consulted. On this. So they play a very valuable role for, for that client group, actually, don't they? Mm. Uh, which is some of their concerns, as you know. Isn't it? Mm. They, don't, they feel they're getting sucked into this and therefore, in a sense, becoming a part of the, the arm, an unpaid <laughs> part, part of the arm of, uh, of uh, public service provision. Um, which, but well, they want to be paid too, they want income. They that, do. That's the trap they're in, as I understand this sector. Yeah. That's the trap they're right. in, not the campaigners now, we're back yeah. into service yeah. providers, but, yeah. but the, they, they're desperate for long term funding, yeah. for knowing what their funding base is, for being more secure. And so they'll snatch at money from yeah. government, whether yeah. it's local or national, they want that money. Yeah. Sure. And so then you start raising up these questions. Mm. And I think they're, you know, mm. we're, right, we're right to raise them, <laughs> but not, in, not as if we're some sort of. Mm. You know, initiating a new uh, Mussolini-style state. Well, no, I'm not really pushing that because you've a much more benign example. It seems to be support for the arts. And the arts is basically, I mean, you know, most of the big arts organisations, in some sense, charities. And you know, Covent Garden <coughs> receives lots of public cash. Mm. And we all know there's been this huge debate over why should public, why should Covent Garden get lots of money to support a program which feeds only mm. a very small elite part of the population. But the idea of being a full democratic profile for opera mm. is blue sky, isn't it? We know that. But you've got museums, of course, fighting like dogs to show that they can bring a full population spectrum in. Mm -hmm. But I don't think the Opera House is going to do it. So, I mean, you know, there's only one way out, of course, which is not to take any government money and to get the people who wanted to pay for it. Yes. We know what the way out is. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, it's exactly this thing, though, isn't it? The Covent Garden was asked to be democratically accountable. The hypothesis would be they think that they need to be accountable to their active membership mm -hmm. and volunteer, and that would uh, undermine them being too... Mm -hmm. Yeah, to uh, focused on the web as mm. a mm. mechanism because mm. it's too uh, it's, it has no boundaries. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. the two spheres they operate in are in conflict. In yeah. Effect. yeah, I think so. The public sphere versus mm. their private sphere of membership, etc. Mm. Yeah. Then many of them we know are not even accountable to the membership, not necessarily representative, because they're not as internally democratic. All of them as. Uh, well, but then they'll have people will exit or not contribute um, if they don't do the right things. I mean, there is competition for funding and for members. And, and anyway.
Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we've run a, run out of time. Can I? Okay. It just remains for us to uh, to thank our presenters very much, indeed. Very stimulating uh, presentation and discussion. Thank you. Thank you.